I'd like to briefly uh, talk a little bit about Jean Viernes and Selmy Domingo. And in my book, there's three types of people on this uh, planet. Those that uh, make things happen, those that are thinking about making things happen, and those that think, uh, wonder what happened. <laughs> Jean and Selmy were, of course, une unequivocally in the first category. They made things happen. I, I um, was just out of high school when I came across uh, Jean and Selmy, and this was in the context of uh, me, with me joining the uh, Union of Democratic Filipinos, KDP, that uh, Jean and Selmy were also members of. And I recall attending the uh, Far West, some of the conferences, including the Far West Convention, and here and observing uh, Jean and Selmy in these gatherings. Uh, one of the things that really strikes me for uh, Selmy is that uh, he has a very uh, strong, flamboyant personality, but very um, able to um, be jovial and be able to engage people in dialogue. Um, also for and, and also Jean, you know, very uh, mellow, kind of more, more of a subdued personality compared to <laughs> Selmy, but that um, one of the things that I, I have learned in, in terms of their lives is that they do have share uh, the parallels that they're, uh, both of their fathers were from, came from the Philippines in the 1920s uh, to work uh, to find a better living here in this country. Um, Jean was born in Yakima, and he <clears throat> was born to Betty and Felix Viernes. And um, Felix Viernes' father had worked up and down the West Coast and finally settled in the Wapato uh, for the uh, family. Jean began his work in the canneries at a young age, 14, 15 years old, and he had, <clears throat> had to kind of fudge his age there a bit to get in the canneries. And, was exposed to the harsh realities of the substandard working conditions and the um, living conditions there, of the um, facilities. And one of the things that uh, then happened is that he advocated for his improvements on an individual basis and then collectively uh, united with um, Jean, I mean with Selmy and others to address that issue. Jean was, was the ninth of, was one of the, was the eldest of the ninth child, and uh, upon his death, he, he was uh, providing fi financial support for his uh, family and his then um, mother, who was a widower. For, for Selmy, he was born in Texas, and this is uh, 1952, and his fa father, uh, Misho uh, Domingo, was came here in 19... Also in the 1920s, and he had traveled, um, and he was actually he had to go to the Philippines. Uh, he was drafted to, the, to fight the Japanese U.S. Japanese uh, war, and upon return, he brought Addie with him. Where's Addie? Where's Addie? Did you know? And so, tell me what is or the third child of five children, and. Also, uh, Selmy, he spent uh, some of the summers there working in the canneries and was exposed to those uh, challenging situations. Uh, and so when Jean and Selmy had met, one of the things that they took on was the uh, forming of a, uh, the Alaskero Canneries Workers Union. And that was initiated by also uh, Michel Domingo Jr. Is he here? Is Michel here? No? Okay. <laughs> yes. So uh, with that, through the ACWA, they initiated, there were um, a lot of gains that they made through legal battles. And, and then what they saw was that there was a need to connect up with the other um, organizations and groups of workers, um, workers of color. So in 1973, the um, Alaska Canaries Workers Association, the 
uh, United Construction uh, Workers, primarily of uh, Black and African American workers, as well as, as, well as the Latino uh, workers from the Farm Workers, uh, the United Farm Workers of America. They pulled their resource and came together to form the Northwest um, Law and Employment uh, Organization, which was the precursor to LILO, which now is the legal legacy of equality, uh, of leadership, and organizing. Um, so, in, in their efforts, uh, one of the things that became clear to them was the need to uh, make these connections with all of the workers across the world. Uh, the heritage and legacy of the ILWU um, had a, a very important impact on them. Uh, Jean and Selmy sought out uh, other labor leaders who were active during the 20s, 30s, uh, 40s in the ILWU, including uh, Chris, Chris Mansalves, uh, um, Mario Hermoso, Leo uh, Pablo. Um, so they made connections with folks and uh, through their research, they instituted what, uh, a reform movement within the uh, local ILWU because there was a, a lot of the corruptions that uh, were in existence at the time. So the reform uh, movement was initiated in 1977 and um, then in the uh, 1981, uh, June 1st, was when they actually were able to um, make the fair, uh, first um, dispatching of the, in a fair way. And that uh, was also the time that Jean and Sammy were assassinated on that same day that they were implementing uh, that. Uh, the issue of, of um, then, with, with the workers uh, coming together, in the um, coming in, in with the ILWU and what have you, they uh, very much persisted in their um, efforts. Uh, people who uh, then came in um, are some of the people here, and David David Dello, John Fong, um, Terry Mass, and others who stepped forward to uh, continue that work. One, one of the things for me in regards to uh, the, the, the issue of, of um, international solidarity, as I mentioned, that was a key uh, component in the, in the lives of Gina and Sami. The thing, concretely, how that was expressed was uh, they had passed the resolution prior to their, to their deaths at the ILW convention in, in Hawaii. And that resolution was to call for the investigations of the working conditions of Filipinos um, by the ILWU. Um, that, so, with that, in regards to um, Jean and Selmy, is, is what I recall. And again, as I mentioned earlier, that really uh, they were about promoting uh, dialogue and cooperation and building unity so that through collective action, the people, we can make things happen in this world. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us tonight uh, on this great occasion. And you know, the Candy Singers, my goodness, I think you sounded better than ever. Yeah. <laughs> so you, all, you all are still amazing, I'm not surprised. Uh, but thank you to our international guests, uh, Raisa and Malden, for joining me all the way to participate in this 30th anniversary. And to all uh, former KDP comrades, welcome. Thank you also for coming. And the rest of you, thank you for joining us tonight uh, on this 30th anniversary memorial of the assassinations of Jean and Selmy. Uh, as you, many of you, all of you know, you know Jean and Selmy were uh, officers, newly elected officers in the ILWU Local 37. And as Romy said, they were leaders of the rank and file committee, which, you know, was organized uh, to rid the union, the local, of corruption and, and to put back democratic principles and, and changes for not only the workers but in the industry as well. And we ran on a slate which Emma mentioned last night that she was elected on that first slate in 1978.
the first woman on the executive board of <laughs> And we won a few positions on the board that first time around. Uh, and then in 1980, we ran a full slate uh, and swept every position except the president position. And of course, I think for all of us in retrospect, uh, that was a mistake. I should have ran everything and won everything. Uh, but you know, we were young and naive, really, in those days. We thought that somehow we couldn't beat Tony Maruso, or that we didn't have the experience or the expertise to fill that position. But I think we all know now that we probably really did have that experience. But um, Salome, before we ran in 1980, he had been appointed to the position of Secretary Treasurer, and so he was elected to Secretary Treasurer position, and Gene Veras to the dispatch position, and myself and many others in this room were elected to the executive board. And we had only begun to implement the reform program on the day that they were murdered. In fact, that was the first dispatch of the season. Uh, it was the first time we were implementing a fair dispatch system, uh, and certainly they took advantage of, of that weakness in us. But being that we were also political activists, uh, Selmy and Jean were members of the KDP, um, you know, we brought many of those issues to the union and, and uh, educated the membership around the, because the local at the time was predominantly Filipino. Um, we use that as an opportunity to bring our politics to the union. And fortunately, our politics found a home in the ILWU. The ILWU being a more left-leaning union uh, and had a long history of supporting trade union rights abroad and uh, opposition to a lot of foreign dictatorships. In fact, our union was one of the first to uh, not unload cargo from El Salvador during the war, to boycott, to the coffee boycott, uh, to not unload cargo from South Africa. We have a long, proud tradition and history of international solidarity. So when we brought the resolution to the ILW Convention in 1981 to call for a delegation to go to the Philippines, to look at and investigate the situation of workers there, we didn't think it was an uncommon thing to bring. In fact, it would probably be something that would easily pass within the ILWU. But what we were soon to find out was that actually uh, that resolution was the one thing that the Marcos dictatorship feared. Uh, and partly it was because of the history of the ILWU and the connections through the KDP and through the Philippine movement that we had built those strong international ties to the Philippines and the threat that uh, if the longshore decided to not unload cargo or to stop commerce in any way, that could have had a severe blow to the Marcos dictatorship. So it was shortly after that we returned from the ILWU convention in Hawaii where we did introduce that resolution and it passed. Um, that, um, that the murder happened. But the support, uh, the ILWU continued to support the KMU for, for years after that, which was one of the largest federations in the Philippines. And to this day, we continue to work on and build uh, international solidarity that is so important, I think, as we all realize as uh, global economy that we're looking at, it's more and more important now more than ever to continue to build those ties and to continue to support workers internationally. And I'm proud to say that our union continues to do that. Uh, I do, as Romy said, I, I'm fortunate now to sit on an international transport workers, which is one of the largest international federation of transport workers. And we do have a direct relationship to the Seafarers Union in the Philippines. Uh, and so we, our union continues to build those ties, not only to the Philippines, but to all workers. So thank you again for all coming tonight, for joining us. And, um, you know, we'll reminisce about these next few days. There's other, a lot of other activities planned. So we'll reflect and reminisce. But also, it's a chance for us to also talk about other things that we're doing and the need to continue to build a movement which I know a lot of you are still engaged in, and I'm 
I'm so proud and happy to see you all that you came to support and be a part of it. Thank you. Jeline and Dale's daughter. <laughs> My relationship with poetry is, uh, I started writing a couple years ago. I find poetry is very political. It's, I use poetry to tell my own stories about things that I experience. So uh, two poems that I'm sharing today, the first one is in homage to my mom, <laughs> and it's called oh, <laughs> it's called uh, it's called Mama's Beautiful Tongue, and I wrote it in the class that I now teach at UC Berkeley. I'm a student there. It's called Poetry for the People. So if anyone's interested, let me know. <laughs> How does it start? <laughs> at home, amidst the aroma of chicken adobo, steaming rice cooker clicks up. Crackling music of frying lupia spatters into background among brown flesh hugs from titas and photo albums of homeland days. I hear presence of mama's beautiful tongue. 
a weapon quick to trigger. Hear shouts of bamboo spears from its tip, erupting lava of my own volcano rise up its bumps. Put me in check when I get out of line. I better not raise that voice of mine. Hala putangina mo, Isabella. Gotta listen close to hear beauty inside that fire. But outside comforts of Philippine household, outside walls of family dinners, I hear second generation cousins giggle at TV show mimicking mama's accents. Call her tongue fresh off the boat, third world ignorance. Mama's beautiful tongue mutes in shame. Criticized by inability to lay back, let bottom lip dive into mouth, let upper lip bulge out and pronounce letter F. TH transformed to P, and when mama pronounced X, I can hear spit build and throat like wax dripping into slates of scraped mouth. <laughs> Tongue chokes on colonized language, Filipino teachers forced her to learn in grade school. Thrusted sword, English into mouth, tried to calm boldness of tongue down. Come to this country at 19, and America slices at her bruised organ, tells mama it ain't just brown skin that makes her inferior. But mama, I'm here to tell you it's beautiful. Maganda mama, where your arms roll like coconuts falling from tops of 12 foot trees. Emphasize your eyes and make them fierce like ease. Blow loud white bubbles on corners of mouth when you pronounce them words so particularly. Tongue ripe like mango, melting on moist back. Sour like vinegar that wakens taste buds. Mama spit truth to me in native dialects. Let your accent massage grooves on insides of my ears. Let ancestors see memories into my forgetting brain. Promise I won't call you five, mama. I I won't laugh, cause you raised me under guidance of proud Tagalog wings. Mama, your beautiful tongue is a part of me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that was the first poem. Um, and this next poem, I'm tr kind of trying to decide. I guess I'll do, the, uh, th there's this poem called 23 Years Innocent. And um, I've dedicated it to a very close family friend of mine named Adamo Chan. Some of you may know him. I know Elaine knows him. <coughs> and other people may be affiliated. He's uh, currently in prison for a crime which he did not commit. And um, I think that this is appropriate, especially seeing, I know I don't know if people are familiar with the Oscar Grant case and um, with Johannes Mersley getting out of prison just lately and just seeing how uh, a crime, how it can be not paid for, and then how someone who hasn't committed something is really paid for, and how this often happens in Oakland. I'm from Oakland, so, uh, and my relationship to it. So this is basically a narrative of what happened to him. It's called an eyewitness poem, and it basically dictates uh, what I saw and the, um, my feeling of being helpless in that situation. And so I think it's appropriate. It's kind of off topic for the conference, but I hope you guys enjoy. Brain scrambling through prayers I learned back in the day as we wait in silence for verdicts. Hope this rosary I recite in brain will be good enough. God, whisper this meaning of innocence through judges' deaf ears. Let her see past prior records and stereotypes of violence, spurned from brown flesh, corn rolled, saggy jeans. Let her see through my eyes. Let her see his innocence. Courtroom pews filled with family coming together, pass off tissue, wipe cross nose, dab sweaty eyes. He seated in wooden tombstone. Can't recognize that shaved head where streams of braided black once flow cross back. Orange jumpsuit blinding my vision as salt water smears clumps of mascara. Eyeliner flows cross riverbanks of brown eyelids past that tissue unsee. And as we still sit waiting, I see guards staring at him with anger. One hand on holster of hip where his metal piece begging him to let loose skull cap gifts into cousin's chain, into cousin's chest. Cuff chains suffocate cousin's wrists. Court sees monster. See empty eyes red with anger, his hands built to choke necks, arms instructed to break through doors, lips high teeth to bite through purity of flesh. I see red eyes bleeding fear. See helpless mother reach out for son, God won't let her touch. Can't let lips choke smoothness of bare cheek, can't let a soft hand rub love to damp face. No arms to hold her, guard gotta protect her from criminals she gave birth to. Acid apprehension fills his stomach as winds of anticipation push finger to tap tap. His knee sh sh shake, sweat drips from face as verdict chokes face blue. He turns back to mother. White salt on cheek from dripping eyes, like quivering foot calm, let chain wrist silence. Pray that fake smile can hide pain and shatter heart. Mom, it's gonna be okay. Just another day in a town where we write schools of books and after school programs so we can build concrete bars that pierce holes through flesh and cement ground. Let tears drip onto page as I write my cousin letter. Tell him I'ma make the change the broken promises of politicians never made. I'ma smash fists through statistics that tell us we ain't worth shit. I'ma bring water of hope to that crackling soil our roots call home. You ain't a lost cause, cousin, don't let go. Two years pass, he got 21 to go. 
Thank you. I have been asked to sing two songs. Um, the first one, for those of you who are around for the festivities on Thursday, it will sound familiar. Um, but I feel that it, it definitely speaks to the form as well, um, as we find ourselves, you know, as a transnational community, as Filipinos, you know, at heart and abroad, um, that there are many fundamental changes that need to happen in our government. Um, and so it is time. And uh, the song that I will be singing was popularized by Karitha uh, in the late 1970s, early 80s. And the name is Orasna. And I will be accompanied by Dear Edwin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rene uh, Syria Cruz. I used to be the uh, editor of Katipunan, the uh, newspaper of uh, the Union of Democratic Filipinos, or KDP. I used to be uh, national coordinator of the Anti-Martial Law Coalition. So we would like to welcome everyone to the first uh, uh, Semi Domingo and Jean Viernes Memorial Forum. Uh, hopefully, uh, this will be the start of an institution that we periodically gather friends and uh, people we work with politically for a discussion of uh, events, not just about the Philippines, but hopefully uh, of international events and local events too. So uh, <clears throat> on a personal note, <clears throat> I'm very glad to see everybody, uh, old friends, and uh, very much relieved that everybody got older. Too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love those wrinkles. 
So anyway, uh, I first uh, came to Seattle in the, it was a dismal winter of 1978, I think, or 1979, as the national coordinator of the Anti-Martial Law Coalition. And that's where I first met the Seattle, Seattle chapter of the KDP. I think they were mostly Filipino Americans uh, who didn't speak Tagalog, maybe a smattering of Cebuano or, or Ilocano. And, uh, but they were all working against the Marcos dictatorship, so it was a very good feeling. On the other hand, it was like stepping into a chapter of uh, Carlos Bulosan's America's in the Heart. Uh, again, it was dismal winter, and then sell me Took me on a, uh, took me in this big American car and drove me around, <laughs> and the international district, and uh, we went to. He took me to the uh, Caballeros de Dimas Alang Hall, where a group of old men were playing cards, and we went to the kitchen and raided it. You know, we went. We had a greasy uh, fried fish and uh, and pinakbet. So, and then he took me to a uh, tenement house. I think, and I met the uh, legendary labor leader, Chris Mensalvas, uh, and I, I had a pint of whiskey with me, and so we, jo we had a cheerful, you know, uh, carelessly, recklessly, unmindful of the fact that Chris was already an amputee from diabetes. <laughs> so, but we all had a good time, you know? Uh, and then, uh, Gene I met, uh, well, Gene I met here and then stayed with, uh, in the, uh, when I first moved to the uh, Bay Area headquarters of the KDP in Oakland to be the editor of uh, Katipunan in 1980. Uh, Gene Vienes was there. He had just gone through a labor school uh, in the Bay Area, and he was on his way to the Philippines. Uh, I think for the first time, at least in his adult life. And we gave him a briefing. In the Philippines, he, he visited and met with the uh, leaders of the KMU, or the May 1st Labor Movement. He also spent some time with some units of the New People's Army, somewhere in central Luzon. Uh, came back to the city in Manila, and then felt he was being followed. Came back to the Bay Area, and we debriefed him. And he, when he, uh, a month or so, a couple months later, uh, he and Selmy were gun, gunned down. Uh, so that was my personal Seattle uh, connection. Uh, today's memorial forum uh, honor the work of Gene and Selmy and of those of us who were active uh, during the dark days of uh, Marshall, of, of Marcus's uh, dictatorial rule. Our aim is to gather friends who, and uh, former activists and, and friends who worked with us who were not in our organization uh, to, to have a discussion of what is happening in the Philippines now. When we were working together with most of you, we shared a, a, uh, an orientation with you uh, that gave all of us an understanding of what was taking place in the Philippines. Uh, it was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society. Uh, we, had, we shared the orientation that the Marcos dictatorship was the immediate obstacle to uh, social change uh, and democratic change in the, in the Philippines. Uh, that, that dictatorship served to focus the attention of all progressives and all people working for change on a single target. And that was true for about 14 years. Uh, that was the orientation we worked with. Now, the question is, uh, with the overthrow of the dictatorship, how do we look at events in the Philippines? Now that the immediate obstacle is gone, uh, what has changed? Uh, how do you conduct a struggle under the restored uh, democratic spaces and, uh, and, free and, and institutions? <laughs> Now, uh, in the past, uh, our concrete analysis of concrete conditions, you know, <laughs> uh, it worked for us for a while. You know, we never really, we never, because of the dictatorship, it was immediate, we never really looked, 
look back and try to assess, well, what has changed in the world while we were doing that, okay? And unfortunately, uh, that concrete analysis apparently was casting concrete. <laughs> Still in 1978. You know, meanwhile, I mean, uh, the fax machine has come and gone, and, you know, <laughs> mobile phones. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> you know, Facebook, Facebook, you know. Well, Sam Maria Sisa, the founder of the Communist Party, is now using Facebook. Instead of, you know, but he hasn't changed his analysis. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, you know, the uh, globalization of the economy has really deepened. You know, I just learned the other day that it used to be about 30, 30 countries uh, had a growth rate of 7%. Now there are over 100 countries have a growth rate of 7%. That's a big change in the economic relations worldwide. Uh, back in 1968, the Chinese revolutionaries whom we, we adored uh, uh, was still attacking Beethoven and uh, criticize, yeah, criticizing Confucius. They were not yet singing to hip hop or, uh, or shopping at Prada. You know. uh, all that has changed. But unfortunately, the uh, good section of the progressive movement in the Philippines, uh, a much diminished uh, National Democratic Front, still working under the same concrete analysis of concrete conditions in concrete. You know, so the question is, uh, today, is that how, how are we going to look at things uh, now? Now, I, I'm putting a, a terrible burden on our guest speakers, Walden <laughs> Benio and, and Risa Ontiveros, because we might be expecting them to give us the definitive analysis of, uh, but we're not. You know, we're really just asking them to give us an inkling, you know, so provide us some insights that could at least give us a, a glimpse of the informational ge geology that we could use as a, uh, as a framework for uh, looking at the world, looking at the Philippines, and what has to be done in the context of these new conditions. Okay. Up close in these last few days um, has made us experience what 10 million Filipinos who voted for her for senator in the 2010 Philippine elections saw in terms of her parties and her own political vision and leadership. Indeed, as those of you who have attended the memorial events in the past two days can attest, Risa's presence in this commemoration of Jean and Selmy's legacy has showered our gathering with great political insight and inspiring energy. Risa is the national spokesperson of the Akbayan Citizens Action Party. This, uh, this keeps her in the center of the hottest topics in Philippine politics, such as in the debate on the reproductive health bill against the very conservative opposition to it led by the junior princes of the church, otherwise known as the Catholic Bishops' Conference. <laughs> Risa represented the Akbayan in the Philippine Congress from 2004 to 2010. In her two terms as congressperson, she authored over 80 bills and resolutions championing the rights of women and the poor, calling for reform in government and change in society. At this time, when peace talks are taking place again between the Philippine government and the National Democratic Front, New People's Army, slowly taking place but still going on, I thought it would be fitting to keep in mind that Risa worked for six years in the effort to achieve peace soon after the ouster of Marcos. She was a member of the government negotiating panel for the peace talks with the NDF, and in 1988 to 1992, she was Secretary General for the Coalition for Peace. In 1998 to 1999, she chaired the government panel's Reciprocal Working Committee on Socioeconomic Reforms for the Peace Talks. Risa's political development as an activist and a national leader has its origins in the later phase of the anti-dictatorship struggle. 
Friends and comrades, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our esteemed guest from the Philippines, Ms. Risa Ontiveros Barraquel. Salamat sa inyo. To Rene Seria Cruz, Jeline Avila of the Coalition Against the Marcos Dictatorship, na katipunan ng mga demokratikong Pilipino, lahat pa ng mga kasama, mga kababayan. On this 30th anniversary of the martyrdom of Jean Viernes and Selma Domingo, this week in Seattle, it is good to commemorate and recommit ourselves to their struggle against the Marcos dictatorship by, as Lilo Chairman Nemesio Domingo said in his invitation to these annual commemoration events, linking us back to the work to preserve and deepen the Filipino peoples and the Filipino nation's memory of the reign of the Marcos dictatorship and to broaden the post-Marcos democratic space. As Jeline narrated, I became an activist as a 15-year-old sophomore high school student, so inspired by a symposium of the Nuclear Free Philippines Coalition that mommy brought me to that summer that I organized a nuclear disarmament group in St. Scholastica's College, Manila, the following school year. It was 1981, 30 years ago, the same year that Jean Viernes and Selma Domingo were murdered in the dying years of the Marcos dictatorship. In the following years, as I was growing up in the YS, the Youth and Student Movement, I heard murmurs about two labor and anti-Marcos leaders who had been assassinated in the States, but never even learned their names. So I was so touched to be contacted by Lilo through Jeline earlier this year in Manila to learn that you had been commemorating their deaths and their abiding life's work all these years <coughs> to learn their names and their stories and to be invited with Walden to be a guest at these commemoration events. Memory is an essential element in post-authoritarian democratic transitions as campaigns like the GZOP's Institute's Memory, Truth-Telling, and the Pursuit of Justice assert. We must remember, never forget, what happened to us during the dictatorship so that we may honor those who fought and fell during the night and those who lived and remain faithful to the struggle. Correct our mistakes, complete unfinished tasks, and fill our gaps in uprooting the remnants of authoritarianism. We must tell the stories of that time to lay accountabilities where they lie and to teach our children never again to form in them a democratic political culture and a culture of active citizenship. We must pursue justice to bring genuine closure to the victims and survivors and to once and for all cut the impunity of those who impede the broadening of political democracy and the deepening of social and economic democracy in the Philippines. With the snap elections of 1986, the civil disobedience campaign that condemned the fraud and the EDSA People Power Revolution, and of course, all the years of anti-dictatorship struggle <coughs> that built up to those. As Nathan Kimpo says in Contested Democracy and the Left in the Philippines After Marcos, the Philippines became part of the so-called third wave of democratization in the late 20th century. It opened up the democratic space in the country returned us to the democratization process that by no means completed after decades of struggle against elite rule had been traumatically aborted by the declaration of martial law and resumed the era of what Nathan calls contested democracy in which we are all still enmeshed protagonists. Nathan describes the Philippine left, which consists of various communist, socialist, and social democratic movements, parties, groups, and currents as virtually the only organized political force that has long challenged elite domination of the country's political system. After the Katipunan, from the time of the first communist and socialist parties and the first labor movement during the American colonial administration, to the Hukbong Mapagpalaya ng Bayan during the agrarian uprising in the 1930s, to the Hukbong Bayan Laban sa mga Hapon during World War II, to the nationalist movement and the time of the Filipino first policy from the late 1940s until the 1960s, to the anti-dictatorship struggle during martial law, up to the people power edsa revolution, to the present, the left has been posing alternative visions of society 
the nation, the economy, and the political system, and challenged the primacy of capital, colonization and occupation, and landlord domination, as well as more recently, sexism and patriarchy and ecological destruction. Nathan goes on to narrate, over the past decade or so, new leftist parties and groups have emerged and they are now coming to the fore. This is one such story. And Walden also narrated this last night. Coming from different political blocks, basic sectors, and social movements and regions, we began organizing Akbayan in 1994. After helping pass the Party List Act in 1997, we founded, registered, and first ran Akbayan in the first party list election in 1998 and won our first seat in the House of Representatives. We also began running in local elections that year. We won two seats in 2001, then the maximum of three in 2004. We helped pass human rights and labor laws and such other laws as the Quality Affordable Medicines Act and the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Program Extension with Reforms Act and our authoring measures such as, the, such as bills for overseas Filipinos, the Reproductive Health Bill and the National Land Use Bill. We filed resolutions investigating different burning issues, debated the General Appropriations Act every year, and impeached or tried to impeach a president and an ombudsman. We participated in the EDSA DOS, which ousted former President Estrada in 2001, turned opposition against former President Macapagal Arroyo with the revelation of the Hello Garcia fraud in 2005, resisted the declaration of the state of emergency in 2006, and coalesced with the Liberal Party to support President Noy and run a guest candidate for the Senate last year. All these while building Akbayan as a parliamentary party and at the same time remaining a mass movement party. Nathan, flowing from the first argument, the second part of my argument is that the deepening of democracy in the Philippines mainly involves the transformation of an elite-dominated formal democracy into a participatory and egalitarian one, a process that cannot but consist of intense social contestation. Nathan's first argument is the Philippines is a contested democracy in which the elite and the trapos or traditional politicians, trapo is also the Filipino word for uh, a rag that we use to clean up dirt. <laughs> the elite and the trapos strive to maintain a formal democracy with so-called free and fair elections that they can easily manipulate and dominate and in which large sections of the middle of the poor and marginalized classes, sectors and communities, and some sections of the middle and upper classes as well, work and fight for a participatory and egalitarian democracy. So Nathan's second part of his argument is that the deepening of democracy uh, in the Philippines cannot but consist of intense social contestation as we fight to transform this elite-dominated <laughs> formal democracy into a participatory and egalitarian one. This contestation is over many public goods, active citizenship, electoral enfranchisement, political representation, public accountability, pushing the limits of institutions to radicalize them and make them more responsive to the needs of citizens, especially the demands of the poor and powerless, mobilizing the state and civil society to push radical reforms and challenging the private sector to support them. So political democracy is not just a victory for civil and political rights activists. It is a victory of all social justice activists, including socialists, because it empowers the citizens and reforms the state for further efforts to make society more equitable and just. Nathan, the deepening of democracy, as in the transition to democracy, involves contestation, especially among different classes and class coalitions. And of course, with those public goods at stake, it cannot but be that conflictual and dynamic between these different classes and class coalitions. The traditional and new elites realized that during and soon after each EDSA People Power event and moved quickly to abort that the process could broaden and deepen towards more comprehensive changes of our society in the Philippines fighting tooth and nail as we fought for our alternatives, fighting tooth and nail to preserve their own vested interests. 
Nathan, again, in many parts of the developing world, forces of democracy from below are challenging the dominance of the entrenched elite rule in truncated formal democracies. So while valuing these formal democracies, these mechanisms, handles, or levers for broader and deeper political participation, especially by people, organizations, and communities from below, it's been our sense in Akbayan that we take this formal democracy even more seriously than those who are so comfortable with it and so smugly uh, assured that this is the farthest that real democracy can go in any society. And it is these forces from below that are seeking to realize the true promise or potentials of democracy, especially in the developing world. Nathan, again, the single most important factor for the deepening of democracy is that the mass movement is very much alive and has manifested in various ways its power, adaptability, resilience, and unpredictability. And all of us in this room, even the young people who give us so much hope because they are as at least curious about this tradition uh, that they have been born into, all of us in this room are witnesses to these characteristics of our mass movement, uh, which continuously surprises us, not only surprises the powers that be that we go up against, and enables us to learn from our mistakes, to remain faithful to an original vision, and to seek to adjust the way that we communicate this to the world around us, to fellow citizens and human beings, and to seek their own participation in this struggle. For the emergent leftist, Nathan again, emergent leftist parties and groups forging a deeper unity has proven to be an elusive goal. And I'm not only speaking here of Akbayan's relationship uh, with the extreme left in the Philippines, with whom we have a, a very a very difficult relationship, <laughs> but also other left parties and uh, forces that uh, emerged from that and other parallel traditions and are seeking to reinvent uh, the left in the Philippines, not only to ourselves, but to the whole, to, to all peoples of the Philippines. And that elusive goal is something that we have not given up on. And for the most hard-headed among us, we still cherish that dream of the broadest left unity in the Philippines, perhaps no longer in our lifetime, but perhaps in the lifetime of our children. Walden has already narrated to you the, the major elements of uh, Akbayan's sensing of this first year of the Aquino administration, in which we are a junior coalition partner. And the, 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 the sort of working title we have given this is the rough and rugged road toward change, Akbayan party on the first year of the Aquino government. And he already described to us the stains of the past, a royal decade of corrupt and ineffective governance, <laughs> and the way that we characterize this first year of the Aquino administration, a planting the seeds of change, winning important battles. He scanned the areas of anti-corruption and political reforms, foreign policy, and addressing the immediate needs of the poor in faithfulness to the campaign slogan of kung walang corrupt, walang mahirap. If there's no corruption, there won't be poverty. And most importantly, he shared with you what we feel are the tasks, that, the many tasks that remain. The social contract to broaden and deepen reforms, spanning the protection, prosecution of the corrupt and recovery of ill-gotten wealth, protection of human rights, political modernity, economic development, <coughs> a greater reform and justice, the urban poor. We could also add fisheries reform, a minerals management bill that will be an alternative mining law and a partner to the total log ban, students' rights and welfare, the reform and empowerment of the Sangguniang Kabataan or the Youth Council, the anti-discrimination bill with the LGBT community and the issue of elderly poor pension. And he also included among what must what is to be done? Universal health care. So in addition to RH, the hidden, addressing the hidden but growing epidemic of HIV and AIDS, and working with persons with disabilities for accessibility and their other needs. And he pointed out to us 
What we see are the challenges, not only for the administration, not only for a junior coalition partner like Akbayan, but Filipino citizens' challenges beyond the first year. Lastly, may I just share with you how provocative it has been for us in Akbayan to learn uh, the recent events concerning Jose Antonio Vargas. Um, how he was inspired by young people and students, in turn now affirming uh, the, the actions he himself has taken, but their initial efforts about the DREAM Act and now his initiative, uh, which he has called, they have called Define American. Provocative for us because here is uh, another Filipino, a Filipino-American, who has come clean about himself and has used his, um, his prominence or his exposure to leverage not just for himself, not just for his family, but for all people uh, who are in the same situation and desiring similar reform. So leveraging his uh, position right now for uh, in the interest of immigration reforms. And it's one of our feelings in Akbayan that it is that same sense of boldness, the accustomed boldness of CAMD and KPD and LILO, the boldness which is part of the legacy of Silme Domingo and Jean Viernes, which led to our desire to remain faithful to the visions that first inspired us, that first um, moved us to choose this way of life, led to intellectual rigor that uh, comrades like Walden contribute so much uh, towards, led to the uh, sense of community and comradeship uh, in our movement, will continue to guide us along this not easy, uh, this is often difficult and very conflictual, but the path that we have chosen and the path that we love. So again, uh, marami salamat for inviting us to be part of these commemoration activities. Mabuhay ang demokratikong kaliwa, mabuhay si Inang Bayan. <laughs>
araw-araw ay agad nasisikat Iilawan ang ating landas Nang makaisa bawat nating pangarap Sundan mo ng tanaw ang buhay Mundo ay punang mo ng saya Gawing makuhulay Isa lang ang ating lahi Isa lang ang ating lipi Bakit ipagmamahal ang ialay mo Pangunawang tunay ang siyang nais ko Ang pagdamay sa kapwa ay nandyan Sa palad mo Mundo ay punang mo ng sayat, gawing makuulay. Isa lang ang ating lahi, isa lang ang ating lipi. Bakit ipagmamahal ang ialay mo? Pangunawang tunay ang siyang nais ko, ang pagdamay sa kapwa ay nandiyan sa palad mo. Many of us, um, Walden really needs no introduction. He's one of us, our comrade from KDP and AMLC days, our then in-house analyst, intellectual, writer, strategist, and tactician. Friends who may not uh, directly know him are likely to know of him or have read about him. And if you're a Seattle local and you were in this city in 1999, you may have even seen him on TV news then being beaten up and dragged on the street by a police woman during the WTO <laughs> protests. So this introduction is really to honor Walden. This is um, to give recognition to his many contributions and achievements a way to say, he's our comrade who's done good in his political activism in the progressive movement. So introducing him is also like a nice walk down memory lane. If I were to highlight a couple of moments, Walden moments in his activism um, <laughs> with us, <laughs> no, <laughs> it would have to include <laughs> Of course, the AMLC-7 experience in 1978 when he was jailed together with other supporters and activists for peacefully but determinedly taking over the Philippine consulate in San Francisco in one of AMLC's nationally coordinated campaigns to give trouble to the Marcos dictatorship. Another memorable Walden moment was when dressed as Kermit the Frog, <laughs> he disrupted an IMF meeting. Kermit and Miss uh, Piggy approached the lobby reception of the IMF in Washington, D.C., followed by protesters that demanded to see the IMF managing director. I don't think it was that guy who just got arrested. <laughs> um, when security asked to see IDs, Kermit angrily insisted he was the president of the Philippines, President <laughs> Dictator Marcos. IMF security then descended on Kermit and Miss Piggy and threw them bodily out of the office. <laughs> now, I think Miss Piggy at that time was not yet John, it was somebody else, but John Milibrito has also taken that um, <laughs> Muppet role. So, friends and comrades, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in honoring Congressman Walden Bellew. Very uh, graphic introduction. 
I, um, <laughs> yes, I was in Seattle and I was beaten up by a policewoman, but I'm not going to tell you what I said while I was be beaten up by a policewoman. But uh, in any event, um, um, I'm very happy to uh, be here with old friends, uh, comrades, uh, um, you know, friends and um, old, old friends and old faces that we haven't seen for years. And young faces too, <laughs> you know. Um, I was telling Risa just a few moments ago that, uh, you know, I think Risa, you're probably a generation younger than all of us here. Uh, and she said, uh, yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> but she said, uh, of course, that, does, that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so let me first of all express my appreciation for your inviting me to this 30th anniversary um, of the murder of Jean Viernes and Silme Domingo, uh, two heroes of the US working class and the Filipino community. As a member of KDP, I was privileged to have known Jean and Selmy, though perhaps not intimate, as intimately as many of you in the Seattle community. I remember two people who were determined to rid Local 37 of gangsters and yellow unionism, but also individuals who were intensely committed to the Filipino people's struggle to rid their country of the Marcos uh, dictatorship. Uh, there were many people who were not with us last night. So I would just want to, because I promised that I would repeat this, that I, um, talking about the Marcos dictatorship, I did not uh, anticipate, you know, that um, about 25 years after the overthrow of the dictatorship, I would be in Congress with Emel de Marcos. <laughs> uh, in fact, you know, part of the same uh, administration coalition uh, with uh, uh, Imelda. Uh, no, she is not part of the minority GMA-led coalition. Um, but, you know, um, in, in I spend much of my time in Congress trying to avoid her <laughs> because she takes every opportunity to try to recruit me into her committee and this is the Committee on the Fulfillment of the Millennium Development Goals of the Philippines. As we all know, uh, she was a very good choice to head up the <laughs> Committee on the Millennium Development Goals, since after all, her husband and her contributed very much to bringing us out of poverty and having our country reach the Millennium Development Goals by 2015. Um, of course, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, in any event, um, uh, the country was rid of the dictatorship in February 1986, but the next quarter of a century was not an easy one. Electoral democracy was reestablished, but the old oligarchic class structures reasserted themselves. Structural adjustment and neoliberal trade policies resulted in the devastation of our agriculture and industry, driving a large force of our labor force, 10%, according to some estimates, to search for work abroad. Unbridled corruption, especially during the nine years of the Arroyo administration, left government coffers empty and people extremely distrustful of politicians. The coming to power of the administration of President Benigno Simeon Aquino III after Mr. Aquino's massive win at the polls in 2010 gave our people tremendous hope and expectations that a new era was at hand. My party, Akbayan, 
the Citizens Action Party, had aligned itself with Mr. Aquino's candidacy. And Mr. Aquino's asking Risa Hontiveros, who is with us here this afternoon, to run as a guest candidate on the Liberal Party slate was emblematic of the value he placed on this alliance. We in Akbayan supported the coalition that brought Pinoy to power because this coalition had a strong reform agenda based on two pillars, <coughs> ridding the country of corruption and tackling the country's enormous poverty problem. Two pillars which could serve as the basis for more comprehensive reform. Our presence in government was a sea change for our party, for ever since we participated for the first time in the electoral process in 1998, we had been, for the most part, a party in opposition. Indeed, we had been unrelenting in our efforts to expose the corruption of GMA and her effort to change the Constitution in order to perpetuate herself in power. Now, we were confronted with the challenge of being part of a coalition in power, of having our people in Congress and in the executive who were expected to deliver concrete reforms. It has not been an easy first year. On the anti-corruption front, a major instrument to bring GMA and her cronies to justice, the Truth Commission, was prevented by an obstructionist Supreme Court filled with appointees of the former president from being formed. More important, the ombudsman, Mercedes Gutierrez, stood like an immovable stone blocking all efforts to investigate and prosecute the former first family and their accomplices. Until she was removed, the anti-corruption campaign would be stalled. This is why we, in the administration coalition in Congress, devoted so much time and effort to impeaching her, which we finally succeeded in doing in March of this year in a historic lopsided vote. Rather than be prosecuted in the Senate, Gutierrez resigned. This has paved the way for using the office of the Ombudsman to bring Mrs. Arroyo and her cronies to justice. Meanwhile, prosecution of the notorious NBNCTE broadband scandal principles is moving. Cases have also been filed against GMA for the diversion of funds of the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration and the Department of Agriculture to her and her cronies' personal coffers. The Bureau of Internal Revenue is bringing former presidential son Mikey Arroyo to court for massive tax evasion. As Jalene said in my first privileged speech during the 15th Congress, I said that Mrs. Arroyo, who had joined us in the House of Representatives as Congresswoman of the 2nd District of Pampanga, had no business being in Congress and that she belonged instead to the new beloved prison in Muntinlupa, <laughs> 20 kilometers away. <laughs> For this speech, as Jalin also said, I was accused by GMA's allies of violating parliamentary courtesy <laughs> and brought up before the House Ethics Committee. But however the case against me fares in the House Ethics Committee, I am now so much more confident after all these developments that justice will be meted out and that in the not too distant future, we will see former President Arroyo in Muntinlupa. Yeah. I think that largely because his integrity has been unimpeachable and because of his perceived determination to clean up government, Mr. Aquino, after a year in office, continues to enjoy a high trust and approval rating of 71%, of, um, uh, of 71 according to the most recent Asia Pulse, um, uh, Pulse Asia survey. The anti-corruption campaign is going ahead. So has the anti-poverty program been moving forward. 
The main mechanism to deal with poverty that the administration has chosen is the Conditional Cash Transfer Program, or the CCT. The CCT gives families as much as 1,400 pesos a month, or the equivalent of uh, $32, in exchange for keeping their children in school and subjecting them to health, periodic health checkups. Patterned after successful CCT programs in Brazil and Mexico, the extra cash provided by the Philippine program is the only resource that poor families have to devote to health and education, which is important to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. In the last 12 months, some 2 million Filipinos families have been, will have been en enrolled in the program by July 4th. The results of the CCT and other anti-poverty initiatives of the administration have made a difference in the lives of Filipinos. According to the latest Social Weather Stations survey, between the first and second quarters of 2011, there has been a 5.4% drop in the number of hungry households. In other words, there are fully a million fewer hungry households in just three months. The total hunger rate has fallen to 51.1% of households from the 21% during the last semester of the Arroyo administration. And the 2.0% of families experiencing severe hunger is the lowest since 2003. Of course, we cannot rest on our laurels and we can only be satisfied when we have completely banished hunger from the country. Of course, the administration has had its, shares, its share of embarrassments. The Luneta grandstand hostage-taking fiasco comes to mind. Another is the factional rivalry so well reported in the press. And of course, one cannot justify the president's buying a Porsche, even if it was third hand, or he's not serving as a good model for public health by his continued smoking. <laughs> <laughs> and while his total lag ban, um, ban on lagging is a major step forward in reversing deforestation, he must be told he must stop going around the country inaugurating coal-fired electricity generating plants since every school child knows that coal is a worse emitter of greenhouse gases than oil. Yes, we have an energy crisis in the Philippines, but we cannot afford shortcuts like establishing coal plants and, take and we should instead take advantage of the crisis to adopt really renewable energy options. We in Akbaya never had any illusions that there were diverse forces in the administration coalition and that some of these forces are averse to the structural reforms that we as the principal progressive force in the Philippines and we are the principal progressive force in the Philippines, feel are necessary to bring about dynamic economic growth, greater equality for our people, and a sustainable society. The challenges that we face in the next five years of this administration are many. And we will fight to bring about, among other things, the following. First, a new deal for the Philippine working class that banishes the plague of contractualization. Second, the reversal of the policies of trade liberalization and globalization that have destroyed so much of our agriculture and industry. Third, a moratorium on the repayment of debts, which we have paid many times over and which now take up some 20 to 25% of the government budget. Fourth, the full implementation of the Agrarian Reform Extension Law, CARPER, of which Risa Antiveros was one of the co-authors, and the consolidation of land reform. Fifth, an end to demolitions and evictions and the provision of innovative socialized housing services for millions of urban poor families. Sixth, a new macroeconomic paradigm to bring about Philippine development that takes advantage of the country's natural advantages in agriculture. We cannot promise we will win these battles, 
But what we can pledge is that we will give the struggle, struggle our all. In the next few months, the key political battle will be the fight over the Reproductive Health, Family Planning, and Population Management Bill. The key aim of this measure, which has been brought before the House floor after over 12 years of struggle, is to provide free contraceptives, free counseling in family planning, and sex education for our less privileged countrymen and countrywomen and for our young people. 400,000 abortions and over 200,000 maternal deaths now take place because of the lack of access to contraceptives and family planning services. The Philippines' failure to control its population growth, moreover, is one of the principal forces preventing sustained and sustainable development and keeping so many of our country, of our people, poor. The rest of the big countries of Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia, have over the last 40 years successfully managed their population growth and have gone a long way to substantially eliminating poverty. Just to give an example, Thailand has smaller, had a smaller gross domestic product than the Philippines in 1975, but it had roughly the same population size, the same high population growth rate, and the same percentage of people living in poverty. Thailand was able to reduce its population growth rate to 1.3%, while the Philippines declined to only 2.3% in the period 1975 to 2005. During that period, Thailand's GDP grew by 4.9%, while the Philippines grew by a minuscule 0.4%. By 2005, Thailand's GDP was $176.6 billion, while the Philippines was, set, was $99 billion. By 2005, there were 84.6 million Filipinos or over 20 million, more than the 63 million Thais. By 2005, owing to its successful population management, Thailand's GDP per capita was $2,750, or nearly triple that of the Philippines, which stood at $1,192. As of today, only 13% of Thais live under the poverty line while nearly 30% of Filipinos do. But we are falling behind not only Thailand, but Indonesia, once the basket case of Southeast Asia, which has only 7.5% of its people living in poverty, and even Vietnam, where the poverty rate is 14.5%. Vietnam, which started its economic ascent just as late as the mid-1980s. I give these shocking comparisons to underline the stakes in the battle for the reproductive health and population management bill in the Philippines. And in this connection, I wish to commend the president for the political courage he has shown in supporting the bill. In the Philippines, it takes political courage to go against the Catholic Church hierarchy, which has threatened political retribution to members of Congress and other elected officials who will vote or support the Reproductive Health Bill. RISA, by the way, is one of the country's staunchest champions of reproductive rights, and not surprisingly, she is also one of the figures most demonized by the church hierarchy. But the long and short of it is we have no choice but to win this battle. As chairman of the Committee on Overseas Workers' Affairs, I have gained a deeper understanding of the travails of our countrymen and countrywomen who are forced to go abroad to seek work, any kind of work, because of the way wrong policies or lack of good policies on such issues as reproductive health have prevented the Philippines from developing. Every crisis in almost every part of the world becomes an internal crisis for the Philippines because there are almost invariably many Filipino workers in any spot of the world whose livelihoods are threatened by natural disasters, <coughs> nuclear disasters like the Fukushima disaster, and political events 
such as developments in the Middle East. We try to do the best we can to protect our workers. For instance, after an investigative mission to Saudi Arabia last January, we came out with a report recommending the non-deployment of domestic workers to that country owing to the grave dangers of rape, sexual abuse, and maltreatment that they face there. And just last May, after an investigation of the case of 11 trafficked workers in Mississippi, we came out with a report urgently calling attention to the expansion of labor trafficking to the United States and recommending steps that both the Philippine and US authorities should take, such as the prosecution of the transnational, US transnational services firm Aramark and investigation of possible collusion of elements within the US embassy with labor traffickers. And this was, as I said yesterday, this was um, a fear that the FBI uh, itself expressed um, uh, regarding the uh, possibility of embassy traffickers collusion. Yet, these measures are like the proverbial Dutch boy's finger in the dike. Unless we forge a new macroeconomic paradigm that provides the jobs and opportunities at home for our people, abuse and exploitation of our most vulnerable workers will continue to proliferate. The president understands this. Indeed, he has stated that one of his objectives is to create the conditions under which our workers will no longer be forced to go abroad to find decent work. But while one cannot dispute the president's concern for our OFWs, sometimes it leads to policy fumbles. The most disturbing of this, from my point of view, was his not going to Oslo last December to attend the Nobel Prize ceremonies for the Chinese dissenter Yu Xiaobo, so as not to offend the Chinese government and push it to execute three Filipino OFWs condemned to death for allegedly smuggling drugs into China. He was heavily criticized for this in human rights circles, and the Chinese went on to execute the OFWs anyway. Good intentions sometimes leads to some bad moves, but I think the president is learning. This is evident in the way he has behaved on the South China Sea issue. China is currently presenting the Philippines with its gravest foreign policy problem. Not that the United States does not present us with grave foreign policy problems, but at the moment, you know, the most serious of this lies uh, off our coastal waters. Displaying hegemonic ambitions, China has claimed the whole South China Sea, disregarding the 200-mile exclusive economic zone of countries like the Philippines and Vietnam, to which they're entitled under the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Seas, and intimidating our research ships and our fisher folk, and from many reports, firing at our fisher folk and even at our naval vessels. Knowing that China does not respect weakness, or finally realizing that China does not respect weakness, the president has refused this time to give in to intimidation by Beijing, refusing to give any credence to China's arrogant claims. For our part, Akbayan filed a bill in the House of Representatives proposing changing the name of the South China Sea to the West Philippine Sea. <laughs> well, the Department of Foreign Affairs in Malacanang accepted our suggestion, and our government's new official name for the South China Sea is the West Philippine Sea. I would appeal to all of you to join us and especially instruct your children to call that body of water by its new name <laughs> and to correct their teachers when they reflect, refer to the South China Sea, the West Philippine Sea as the South China Sea. <laughs> the challenges that we confront are many and difficult. In this connection, 
We have always seen the Filipino community in the United States, as well as the broader American people as important allies in our country's continuing fight for freedom, equality, and development. Gene and Selmy, KDP, AMLC, and Camdi made a historic contribution to forging this trans-Pacific links of solidarity. I'm confident we will continue to nurture and strengthen these bonds of kinship and solidarity. I thank you very much. We shall be all.